Don't get me wrong, but I do really love the look of Salkin from space. There's just something about its bright yellowish colors that really appeals to me. So one of the things I've actually been doing is trying to recreate it in Blender. And this is what I came up with. It looks really different from the Space Engine version. I mean, there's a lot I'd improve to this if I knew how to. Well, but for one of my first renders, yeah, let me know. Well hello everybody and welcome back to Project Espa. My name is Yiji and in this series I walk you through my process of world building my world Espa. With today's focus being on adding the main Jovian gas giant of our system, Manta. So let's dive right in. So thus far in the project we made a trinary star system with great orbital separation, so our solar analog main component has enough space for a solar system type planetary system, which we then worked out to have 8 planetary orbits, of which thus far 2 planets have been worked out. They are a Kundor, a hot, small lava planet in tight orbit close to the star, and Salkin, a hot sulfur planet with a corrosive environment of sulfuric acid. Today we are skipping over the third orbit, which is reserved for Espa itself. Espa being the focal point of the project, I will tackle last, it's gonna be the most detailed, so let's first make sure everything around it is in order before we dive into that. Thus so today we are filling my fourth orbit, which is just beyond the system's frost line and home to my system's main Jovian planet called Manta. Having a Jupiter analog planet is all but required for habitable systems, and as such the planet Manta was already present in my early 2013 versions of Espa. While its mass was initially unspecified, I later made it a more massive and larger Jovian during the 2016 and 2017 versions. It's tricky playing with the mass of your largest planet, it having a whole range of effects I didn't fully understand at the time, so in the 2020 version I moderated its size and mass being a bit more cautious. For this version though, I do now understand the ramifications of increasing the mass a lot better. Or, well, at least I think I do. So let's try to make a Jovian gas giant that's a lot more massive than Jupiter, which is a pretty loose goal compared to what we set ourselves thus far. Okay, a massive Jupiter. Let me stress this, but when building a planetary system, the Jovian is the most critical part because this object will have shepherding effects on the rest of the system. If you want to really get into detail, I can recommend Brain Truffle's video about this subject, but the bottom line is that Jupiter shields the inner solar system from meteors and comets today, and in the past was basically kingmaker when it came to how planets formed in the inner solar system. Having all sorts of fun effects for us to analyze, mitigate, and play around with today. Oh boy. When planetary systems form, it's common for the most massive planet to do so first, meaning that Manta will be the oldest planet in our system, just as Jupiter is the oldest in ours. Since we are modeling the system after the solar system, we will need to address something called the Grand Tech Hypothesis. The Grand Tech Hypothesis poses that shortly after Jupiter formed, it started migrating inwards towards the Sun, where it scattered and depleted material from the protoplanetary disk that would have otherwise gone into forming the inner planets. Coming as close as 1.5 astronomical units before being locked in orbital resonance with the newly formed Saturn, which then pulled it back out, preventing it from becoming a hot Jupiter and allowing the inner planets of our solar system to form unobstructed. Hence, Grand Tech explains why the inner solar system doesn't contain any super Earths, why Mars isn't that massive, and even why the Earth has so much water. While this last one was previously best explained with the late heavy bombardment, our understanding has since shifted. I would really love to go into more depth on this, but that's another video I'm afraid. While Grand Tech is just a hypothesis, it's currently at the core of our understanding of the formation of the solar system. With the Ojoran system being directly based on the solar system, the Grand Tech hypothesis is something I really don't want to mess with. Not only are the mechanics behind it an absolute nightmare on themselves to change, but right now we don't really know if a solar system like planetary system, like that of Ojor, could even form at all without a Grand Tech process. So I'm going to take a, if you don't understand it, don't change it approach, and do the uncreative thing of just hard copying reality here, and say the exact same thing occurred in the early Ojoran system, with Manta migrating inwards before being pulled back out by the next planet. 
That said though, Manta is in Jupiter and it being so much more massive will have effects. Okay, let's start building. Let's set Manta's mass at 2.44 Jupiter masses, or 377 Earth masses, and a diameter of 1.9 times that of Jupiter at about 152,000 kilometers across. Gas giants being mostly made of gas do not increase much in size with their mass. Instead, most of it going to their density. At this planet's size and mass, its density would thus be about 2.5 grams per cubic centimeter, almost twice that of Jupiter, while its black body temperature would be around negative 180 degrees below zero, its actual temperature would depend on how deep into the atmosphere we are. At the one bar point, let's say it's about negative 155 degrees Celsius. We already know it orbits at 4.81 astronomical units, so we can then also figure out its orbital period to be about 11 and a half years. And its eccentricity and inclination would be minimal due to its mass. So, then let's look at our composition. The inner core of such a planet would likely be composed of the heavy materials, which sank, such as rock, metal and heavy hydrogen compounds. The core of Manta could be quite large despite strong gravitational compression, roughly around the size of Uranus, or 50,000 kilometers across. Pressures this deep into the giant would feasibly exceed 1 million bars, upon the maybe 40 to 70 Earth masses contained in there. This core would then be surrounded by a layer of supercompressed hydrogen in liquid metallic form, existing under a million bars of pressure and extending up to over 100,000 kilometers from the core. This layer would generate an intense magnetic field, perhaps even 10 times stronger than that of Jupiter, 20 to 40 Gauss, creating strong, vivid auroras near the planet's poles. Then above this we would find a convective layer of liquid hydrogen and helium extending up to 130 kilometers from the core, being forced into liquid state under the high pressures. The convective nature of this layer being vital in heat distribution between the dense metallic hydrogen below and the atmosphere above. The atmosphere above would initially be hot before gradually cooling in the upper layers, its size stretching to fill the remainder of Manta's radius, forming ammonia clouds similar to what we see on Jupiter Saturn. On Jupiter, the characteristic cloud bands of the planet are created by alternating jet streams flowing parallel to the planet's equator. And these would similarly exist on Manta. These bands are mainly created through the planet's fast rotation, but as we saw in the collab video I did with Times Infinity last time, mass, temperature and haze layers also play major roles. But I do quite like the look of Jupiter, so let's not change these too much. Let's mimic its fast rotation and set Mantas to 11 hours. Weather on this planet would be much more extreme than on Jupiter due to the increased gravitational compression, atmospheric density and internal heat. These factors combined would generate larger, longer lived and more frequent storms such as Jupiter's great red spot. Wind speeds here might be up to twice as strong as on Jupiter, reaching up to 600 km per hour, or up to three times more powerful than a Category 5 hurricane. So let's add maybe two or three major ones near the planet's equator. I could really put these anywhere, but I just think I like them the most here. The internal heat would dull the cloud band contrast slightly through haze layers, but it would not be anything near Saturn levels. Okay, now that we have a pretty clear profile of the most massive non-stellar object in our system, there is some effects we will need to consider with regards to its mass. Firstly, if we apply the Grand Tech model in this system, our second gas giant, the one in the next orbit over, will also need to be around two and a bit times more massive than Saturn to be able to tech Manta out. That's a small restriction, but something we will have to keep in mind for when we arrive there. Our second restriction has already been implemented, so that saves time. It has to do with the inner planets. When Jupiter underwent its migration, it started to have thinned out the inner disk, causing Mars to be so lightweighted as well as scattering materials so no super-Earths could form. 
With Manta, this effect is going to be amplified. So due to its mass, no Mars-like planet can form in our system. Which is great, because Mars is overrated anyways, and I didn't put any analogs to it in the Ojoran system. Instead, we might see a couple more Cirrus-like dwarf planets in a scattered asteroid belt. And our third effect will consider the system's barycenter. With Ojor already being less massive than the Sun, this will tug the system's center of mass even further out from the star, meaning Ojor itself will wobble around a bit in the inner solar system. Alright, alright, I'll get to the part you're all here for probably. Gas, giant, moon systems. And boy, let me tell you, it's not simple. The old moon system for Manta I designed in 2018 and is utterly broken. Obviously building a whole moon system is a pretty big task for one video, so we'll flesh this out in a follow up, but for today let's go over why this was terrible and how I can do better in 2025. Based on our very limited understanding of gas giant moon systems, which I want to stress is very limited, since we can only study those four in the solar system after all, two of which aren't technically gas giants, and one of which likely had major disruptions to its moon system in the past, so we can only really use Jupiter here, which isn't great. Nevertheless, there are some trends and rules in place that we can deduce. First off, there appears to be a slight inverse correlation between gas giant mass to moon system mass. Meaning the more massive your gas giant, the smaller your moon system's mass fraction will be. This is anything but exact science, but for realism you'd be most comfortable having the combined mass of your moon system be a mass fraction between 1 to 2000 and 1 to 5000 with the planet. For Manta, let's use 1 to 4000, meaning the combined mass of our entire moon system should not exceed 0.2 Earth masses. Furthermore, the moon's density seem to decrease as their distance to the planet increases. Moon systems form from accretion disks, similar to planets, which mean they will essentially resemble miniature planetary systems, with the more rocky bodies further in and the ones that are more icy further out. This though is a general pattern and not an absolute one, as this trend is a lot less pronounced in the Saturnian system for example. Current understanding links this to the colder temperatures at which Saturn's moons formed, but further study is definitely needed to confirm this, so let's broadly adhere to this pattern for now. Having our density spectrum slide from 3.5 to 2.3 grams per cubic centimeter with distance from the planet. The major moon should be placed in a range governed by the complex interactions between the planet's mean Roche limit, tidal interactions, orbital resonances and the planet's hill sphere. While the math behind this is complex, in general you should not put your first moon closer than 4 planetary radii out from the planet's center. While they could theoretically exist right up until the Roche limit, in an aged and realistic system like the one we are making here, this becomes less likely due to the gravitational interactions these bodies would have had over time. So let's put our first moon at 312 kilometers out or 4.1 planetary radii. Then there is resonance, also known as the bane of astrophysics world building. Jupiter's Galilean moons have a 1 to 2 to 4 Laplace resonance between Io, Europa and Ganymede. Callisto, which is further out, is non-resonant. This resonance chain is key to the prevailing stability of the lunar system. While Jupiter's system only has 4 major moons, Manta's has 6, so it might seem reasonable to extend this resonance chain to 1 to 2 to 4 to 8, but eh. While we have found exoplanetary systems with longer resonance chains, such as Gliese 876, which has one non-resonant planet followed by three in a 1 to 2 to 4 chain, and then there is Trappist's one crazy 8 to 5 to 3 to 2 to 3 to 4 to 3, so yeah. These are planetary systems though, which have much less outside disturbances than lunar systems, which are much more tight and thus much more sensitive. While a three-body chain only needs two matching Laplace angles, for a four-body chain that would be three, which could definitely still happen but would be a lot less likely. That being said, I do think a four-body resonance chain is the way I want to go here for the following reasons. First off, I have six moons, meaning that in a four-body chain I'll still have two outer moons that can insulate them from unwanted bodies flying in to disturb the orbits. But also, and this is a big one, orbit number four already basically lined up to this chain, so it would actually be most likely pulled in anyways. 
These inner four moons are also pretty massive compared to the outer two, which does make them less sensitive to gravitational disturbances. Now as our fourth moon in the chain will already orbit over 16 planetary radii outwards from Manta, we run into a slight problem for moons number 5 and 6, which will need to be much further out to get the effect we want here. To be honest though, there are a whole load of reasons to get them that far out, but I thought I should mention it because they most likely can't form in situ, which is limited to about 27 and a half planetary radii from the planet in practice, meaning they most likely migrated out there. So let's place moons number 5 and 6, 1.6 and 2.2 million kilometers out from the center of the planet. This means they are dynamically decoupled from the resonance chain and due to their lower mass will not disturb it much while also protecting it from outside perturbances. And one final thing, eccentricity and inclination are extremely low in resonating orbits. All this considered, I made a spreadsheet and ran the appropriate formulas like we're getting used to, for each moon to come up with this template for Manta's sextuple moon system. By realism there should also be an inner system of a couple of small moons and an outer system, but those will mostly be small asteroids and not really that important for what I'm trying to do here for now. So maybe I'll allocate those to a supplementary video after I work out the big six, which by the way I'm going to dub Idemei, Tora, Siana, Hera, Tamu and Bomb, with the first four names being recycled from the 2018 version and the final two being new ones. I'll dedicate a video to each of these in the next few episodes, so hopefully you'll join me again for that as we make these moons just as interesting as the planets. Manta is the fourth planet of the Ojoran system. Orbiting beyond the asteroid belt, it's the first planet in the outer system. It's a Jovian type gas giant, but almost two and a half times as massive as Jupiter, and thus its shepherding role in the system is much more pronounced. The planet orbits at 4.8 astronomical units from Ojor once every 11 and a half years. The planet is only slightly bigger than Jupiter at 150,000 kilometers across due to gravitational compressing. It's thus much more dense. Like a typical gas giant, its main composition is hydrogen and helium, with ammonia clouds having a temperature of about negative 155 degrees Celsius in its upper clouds. Manta has much higher storm activity than Jupiter due to its increased density, featuring 11 distinct cloud bands and 3 major storm spots just above the equator and plenty of smaller ones all across. Manta has a system of 6 major moons orbiting the planet, the first 4 of which are resonating in a 1 to 2 to 4 to 8 Laplace resonance chain, and the final 2 playing an auxiliary shielding role to stabilize this system. From Espa, Manta is the second brightest planet in the sky after Salkin, with its moons almost visible to the naked eye under clear circumstances. Alright, so that makes a Manta, our first object in the outer Ojoran system and the most influential one in it. But for now, let's get to the comment of the episode. It is really cool to hear about the environment the conditions on Selkin create, but I think I'll skip on visiting. So yes, I was really happy with how the Selkin episode turned out. I think it's a uniquely interesting planet and tipping my toes into the speculative geology of the planet was also very interesting. I'm going to see about making that a regular segment for my ESPA videos because I think it really helps people engage with the series if the locations are more descriptive like that. So make sure you're subscribed if you want to see how Project ESPA continues and leave me a comment telling me what you think of Manta. Did you like it? Did you hate it? Anything you would have liked me to see expand upon? As always, thank you so much for watching and I will see you guys in the next one where we're going to fine tune the lunar system template starting with the first moon Idemei. Stay tuned.